I was a little surprised when one of my students, having been assigned to do an illustration in a writing project, brought in a picture that he had drawn. I guess I should have been more clear with my instructions that I wanted a word illustration and not a drawing. But this illustrates to us how we use language and how we have different meanings for words and how uh, it's important for us to understand how we use words. Certainly, an illustration can be a drawing. Uh, in a writing class, it was supposed to be with words, but we corrected that as we talk about the use of language. And I think it's similar uh, to an idea that presents itself to us in Scripture as we look at God's attributes, at God's character traits. Uh, when we look at the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, we read that God created us in his image. I think probably to most of us, if we take the word image just out of context, set it out there, that we're talking about a likeness that we can see. Uh, and so that when we say that we're created in God's image, the first thing that might come to mind is that we that God looks like something, and that when he made us, he made us to look like that something. But as we look at the attributes of God, and consider how God revealed himself to us, we find that God reveals himself to us as spirit, that God is spirit. And so I want us to consider this attribute of God, what it means that God is spirit, and why it might be then, and what it would look like for him to create us in his image, but then also invite us into fellowship, a fellowship that somehow can exist between this created being that has flesh and blood, that is, we might say in another uh, English grammar term, is concrete, can be seen, can be touched, can be smelled, can be heard, I suppose we might even say in a weird way, can be tasted. How can we be in fellowship with a God who is spirit? So let's look at this. Let's look at this uh, attribute and how God reveals himself this way and, and what that might mean for us uh, as we are invited to fellowship with God. So let's go back to uh, the whole creation in the image of God and recognize that uh, we don't look like God because God is spirit and can't be seen. And we'll look at a scripture that specifically says that. But what we find when we talk about being created in God's image is that God shared with us some of his attributes. And we find in the creation account uh, three attributes specifically that he shared with us. And I believe that in the sharing of the attributes is um, the building into who we are, into his created beings, the fellowship not just the possibility of, but the reality of fellowship with God, who is spirit. After the f account of the fall, Adam and Eve recognized that, um, there, that something had changed. And they heard God walking in the garden and hid from him. And the account there in Genesis 2 tells us that this was something that they did regularly with God. That, the, that God had created him, the default of God's creation was to be in fellowship with God. And that God fellowshiped with them regularly. But that as we look at the whole of Scripture, then we see that in order to be in that fellowship with God, uh, Romans 3.23, and we'll, we'll come to that verse again, uh, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To fall short of the glory of God means to be not worthy to be in His presence, so that if we are worthy to be in his presence, that means that we are holy. And so we understand that one of the attributes that God shared with us was his holiness. His being perfect, his being sinless. And that Adam and Eve were created sinless. Uh, and that was an attribute that God shared with us so that we could be in fellowship with him. 
Another of the attributes that he shared with us follows on the holiness attribute, and that is that we were made immortal. Now, God is eternal, having no beginning and no end. He didn't share the no beginning part with us, but he did share, and it was his intention, that we have no end, that we be immortal. And we see that in the warning that God gave Adam and Eve, that if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. So it was God's intention that they would not die, that they would be immortal, and that the consequences of disobedience would be the loss of their immortality, they would die. The third of the attributes we find also in God's command to them to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what we find in that command is that the possibility existed for them to disobey God. Now, this is one of the big questions of the ages of theology. Why did God allow this, and why did God create us in this way? And Scripture doesn't specifically answer this question. But what we find is that Adam and Eve were created in fellowship with God. Again, that's the default of creation. God's original choice is that we be in fellowship with Him. And that when they chose to disobey God's command about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they exercised their wills. And so God gave us, in creation, the ability to make those choices. Not to choose Him, because that was the default, but to choose to disobey. And what we find then, as Adam and Eve chose to disobey, is that they lost. And consequently, all of the generations after them, all of their offspring, lost their holiness, lost their immortality, and lost their will. And so that we are born sinful, we are born mortal, we are born in bondage to sin, unable to choose God. So then, this is a predicament uh, that we find ourselves in. Because again, the default of creation is fellowship with God, and He has placed in our hearts that desire, that desire to know God, that desire to be with God, that desire to spend eternity with God in heaven, and not separated from God, in the place of the gnashing of teeth where the worm does not die. Because there is no end to the decay. So we see then that Spirit, God, God who is Spirit, had to provide the means for us to come back into fellowship with Him. And so we go to John, the Gospel of John, in the first chapter, where we read that the Word, who was God in the beginning, and was with God in the beginning, and through everything, everything was made, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is what we read then in John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God. There's our God is Spirit. No one has ever seen Him, because we can't see Spirit. The only begotten Son who is close to the Father's side, has made him known. And what we find is that the Holy Spirit revealing John to John what he needs to communicate to us about the reality of the Word is that God, the Word, who is God, came to us, became a human flesh that we can see, and, and John in his first letter talks about seeing him and hearing him and touching him. That God became visible to us, not just became visible, but became one of us, so that he could reveal to us the invisible God, the God who is Spirit. And so that in that revealing, he could call us back into fellowship. So when we get to the end of John's Gospel, in chapter 20, John 
says to us that he has written everything there so that we might believe in Jesus and in believing have life in his name. Paul picks this idea up in chapter 10 of Romans where he tells us that faith, that is the ability to believe, is ours. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word, God, revealing the invisible God, God who is spirit to us, so that as we hear his word, we are given faith so that we can believe, so that we can trust, so that we can claim the promise of his forgiveness. So here's the dilemma that we find ourselves in. We must believe. But because we are dead in our trespasses and sin, because we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, because the wages of sin is death, we can't believe. But because God gives us the gift of faith, then we do believe, and the result of our believing is the forgiveness of sins. Believing that what Jesus came to do, he did for me. His death on the cross was my death. The sin he took upon himself was my sin. So that as he proved his victory over sin and death by his resurrection, he extends that life to me, and he invites me into the fellowship to participate in his death and resurrection. And we read in Romans chapter 6 that that happens for us in baptism. And so, then, by the faith that he gives to me as a gift, then, by faith, my sin is forgiven, and I am made worthy to be in his presence. By faith, I am plucked from the jaws of death, and I am given life. By faith, I receive the gift, the free gift, the undeserved gift of eternal life. And then, by faith, I live out my life, in fellowship with God, and I offer myself as a living sacrifice to God, which is my service of worship. We read that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so then we go to John again, and chapter 4, and this is a part of the conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And how he concludes that conversation, we read this in verses... 23 and 24 of John chapter 4. But a time is coming, Jesus told her, and now is, where the real worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For those are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It is God's desire that we be in fellowship with him, a fellowship that begins now and will last for eternity. And he has placed that desire in our hearts to be in that fellowship also, to know him and to be with him. And so... God, who is spirit, gave us some of his attributes, his character traits, making it possible for us to be in fellowship with him. But it's a fellowship that was lost because of our sin. And a fellowship that can be and is restored because he has come to us in Jesus, who took upon himself our sin, who died our death, who was raised from the dead to prove his victory over sin and death, to extend to us life through the forgiveness of sin. God, who is spirit, invites us into fellowship by redeeming the spirit in us. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of the conversation.